today we're going to be talking about remote work or distributed work, however you want to phrase it. There's been a lot of controversy around this lately. I just wanted to get some thoughts out there with Bill and Neil. So here is Pseudo Show 63, Distributed Work. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show. This episode is brought to you by Linode, now called Akamai Connected Cloud, a massively distributed cloud and edge platform. Sign up today at linode.com slash tux to get a $100 credit and start deploying your workloads where your users are. While you are there, use that credit and spin up a Linode virtual machine and deploy the pseudo show application of the month and test out Neth Server 8 Beta on an enterprise Linux distribution since, such as CentOS Stream 9. At Tux Digital and the Pseudo Show, we love Linode because it is easy to deploy virtual machines to test and roll out new applications like Neth Server 8. Deploy a Linode virtual machine and take advantage of Linode's affordable block storage as the backend storage for Neth Server 8. And let us know in the Tux Digital forums how it went. Remote work. So guys, I think uh, we are, we're all pretty well familiar with remote work, especially given the last uh, three-ish years. I'm definitely familiar with it being mostly remote my entire career, except for probably were three, you a bus boy or something? <laughs> three years. Well, my first job, I had to be in the office because I was uh, at Novell's IT help desk. Right. I remember that. Bill, don't you remember that? And I was imaging uh, ThinkPads with uh, NLD9, Novell Linux Desktop 9. We're going back to IBM ThinkPads here, right? Yeah, this, so this would have been T430Ps. And this would have been a good callback to our episode where we trapped Brandon in jail and made him tell us about himself. I think we even gave him a T430P to survive on while he was in jail. It wasn't working though. That was important. No, you I had to make I, it work. I still, I have a T60. Right, we were talking about this right before we hit record. You know, what I think there's been this illusion, maybe not illusion is not the right word, but misinterpretation uh, of what remote work is that it's a, a new concept or that it's uh, fundamentally ineffective. There's a huge push in some areas to, in some organizations to go back to the office. Neil, Neil made a great point, and I'll let him expand on it, that we've always had remote work because we have distributed teams. We've had distributed teams for as long as I've been in this industry. And, and it is definitely distributed even before. Yeah. So like, if you think about companies being born in the internet era, uh, and even maybe a little bit before that, if you think about those companies that are born during these time frames, they obviously start with just maybe one location, but they very quickly branch out into more locations, especially as um, they need to serve more types of customers across the world, make things easier for them, cost reasons, whatever that may be. The end result is that companies wind up very quickly becoming distributed. They wind up having multiple facilities. They have multiple offices where people are working on stuff together. And the an outgrowth of that is that you, you typically wind up having techniques for having to coordinate um, engineering efforts or communications efforts or sales efforts or whatever across different regions. That, that's just sort of a thing. And... That is essentially distributed work, which we now really call remote work. It's not just about, you know, people working from their home, doing all the things. It's also the people that are working in different offices against each other, 
or the people that are always traveling but still working. The road warriors, so to speak, which have been around for a very long time. Most of my team is distributed or remote. And part of that reason is our office is just too small to accommodate everybody all at the same time. It wouldn't be practical for me to invite everybody to the office or mandate that they come in. And that's been that way since our company was founded back in 2001. We've always worked remote unless someone has to go on site to do physical work at a client office. And in fact, I think it works better for a lot of my team when they have to concentrate on conference calls or meetings or projects where they won't necessarily have the noise and the interruption of a team in the office tapping them on the shoulder or calling them on a a desk phone or any of the traditional interruptions that they're used to. Now, occasionally they do like to come in just so they can say hi to everybody, grab some coffee, eat some lunch, grab some hardware that they need play around with some new stuff, and then maybe we don't see them for a week or a couple of weeks. One of the things that I have definitely been missing, because I haven't been traveling like I used to. I used to be on the road. Well, I'll just say it's a lot. It was a lot. Probably 150,000 domestic miles every year, roughly 75% travel. But one of the things that I've been missing is that in-person connection, sitting down in a conference room and you know, getting in front of a whiteboard and actually talking to people, throwing ideas at each other in a, in a very collaborative fashion. One of the things that we would do is right after that, we'd go and go away for a month, get what we discussed done, and then come back and talk about it, where, where, we're, where we're at with the projects or where we're at with uh, all the specific milestones that we that we had discussed, or if uh, to me that's a bit more productive, and like we still communicate because we now have better tools that twenty years ago we had still had per- similar tools, but they were I'll say intuitive project management tools. You were typically reliant on a, a tool that was on someone's laptop, like my specifically like Microsoft project. Now you now it's all in one central place. Everyone can see their tasks. Everyone can update their milestones. If you're using Trello, updating your cards. So everyone knows where everyone's at. To me though, this is starting to sound familiar. It's starting to sound a lot like an open source project, right? We like some of the open source projects I had been involved in way back in the day, we get together at a conference talk about what we need to do for the year, and we go back, do it, go back to the conference the following year. <laughs> and uh, and, then we, and the way we show our work is through commits or through, uh, if you're not coding, it's through achieving uh, those milestones that aren't, aren't coding, whether that's evangelism or I guess packaging could be considered coding. It just depends on, on your point of view. You know, something that we're just all familiar with at this point uh, in, in in this open source space. So maybe it's, uh, this has been less foreign to us uh, as open source technologists than in the business world where, where we have uh, leaders saying, if you're not in the office, you're probably going to hold back your career. I, I don't know if that's really the case anymore. I think it depends on the role that you're filling in the company too. There's certain folks in my company that never come to the office and they have got promotions and pay increases and other platitudes because the quality of the work is there. And sometimes it's not always about the tangible projects and milestones. Now I work in the small business world and so I have a little bit more flexibility with with my metrics. So if I know that someone is doing what they need to do and then some, whether they're in the office or not, they're going to get noticed and they're going to get taken care of for it. Now, Neil, you travel a lot now, and you what I think is unique about your circumstances is that you tend to go to the same conference every year, multiple conferences. So you're dealing with distributed teams in some of the projects that you work on a lot more than I do. So I'm really curious when you get together, let's say, with one of your conferences you went to last year versus one that you're going to this year for the same group. 
What's that like when you guys all get back together? Are you talking about those milestones or is it more of a social gathering? Like, I'm, I'm really curious what that snapshot is like for you. It's a great question. Um, I would probably say that it's a little bit of a mixture of both. It is very much a to the knuckle of like a sync up type of thing. So typically what happens with these conferences to to make it clear, this is open source software conferences that I go to because I participate in a wide range of open source projects across a full gamut of of spaces and and interests um in particular it's it's usually like the through the previous year people have done a lot of things and they're talking about what they want to do going forward and so there's a lot of presentations done and then there's some workshops that are also done for learning and advancing and some hack fest to be able to get some concrete work done with everybody together in a high bandwidth scenario and then there's also a social period because we got to have bonding and bring everyone together to like feel like a, a, a team together. Uh, I think if you decompose all these things that I said, and you think about it even in the context of how people would do it with um, in-office work or, or local work, as, as I will term it here, they're not that different, right? In local work, you have teams working together in a facility like an office or, or, or data center or whatever. They're doing a bunch of tasks together. They'll probably recuperate back, take some learnings, do some planning to do that sort of thing. And then after a bunch of this, periodically, they'll go and do some kind of social event so that they can bond together and like blow off some steam and relax and, and become more connected with each other. Humans are social creatures. We need those aspects. But we're also trying to be productive creatures. And so we put a lot of stuff that we want to do as part of it. So. That balance of work and play comes into, well, pardon the pun, comes into play a lot when you are doing events like this. And th this is basically the bulk of my experience. When we're outside of those events, it's essentially distributed remote work, and people are operating completely asynchronously, sometimes pseudosynchronously, across a range of time zones and offsets. So these events are really helpful because it brings everyone together in a localized fashion that they can sync up before they go back out and go do more things. So it sounds like to me that in order for that to be successful, you need some good tooling in place, like either a Git or a Pagger or something like that, in order for that group or that community to be able to have the baseline for their collaborative efforts. If we step back from software development, which admittedly we've been kind of working around. Let's talk a little bit in more more general collaboration capabilities. You you need to have a way for people to communicate with each other. So you need uh both synchronous and asynchronous methods. So like for example, um uh you would probably want to have some kind of email platform like Google Workspace. You would need some documents and file locker platforms like um, only Office or LibreOffice Online, along with Nextcloud or whatever, or even using it with Google Drive, sure. Um, and then chat, you know, things like Element or um, uh, Mattermost are often good choices in this regard. Like you, you, you go down the list of like, there's the basic needs of communication and collaboration that you have to fulfill to get there. And then after you get the tools, it's not just the tools that you need. You also need the, you need the mindset. And that's always the hard part. Like thinking about working with people that you're not directly in front of. It means having a mindset of thinking positively about people. It has a mindset of, um, you know, best, a good faith effort and, and working in such a manner where um, you trust them to, on, on a handoff and things like that. Right. Those are uh, depending on what type of line of business you're in, right? You're going to have different tools to augment that. But at the core of it, you have to have the mindset and the culture to make it work. Because if you don't have the trust and the care and the, and, and the, the attitude, it's not going to work. It doesn't even matter whether it's localized or remote, but it's especially not going to work when it's remote. You're still holding people accountable one way or the other, you know, whether they're doing the work or whether they're not. I think that is what's been frustrating me 
recently when people say you need to come back into the office or you're going to destroy the economy. Actually, it was today a, a celebrity. I don't remember uh, which, which one. Uh, I think it was actually. I think it was Martha Stewart said that if uh, we don't return to the office, we're going to destroy America. I, <laughs> it, that was the headline. I didn't read the the whole thing. It just really irritated me. And and just I'm like, we're just trying to accomplish work, and remote work is just one way of accomplishing work. But, and what I mean is remote work, meaning working from home, or even worse, accusing people of you know, working from home and coasting by. My wife will tell you that I probably wor- would work less if I worked at an office. I work way more than, um, than most people I know that do commute into an office. I probably pull 80 hour weeks, uh, no problem. And that's a, I'm mostly accounting for, okay, I left my my dedicated room that is my office and i took my laptop out happened to open it up and check my email or you know, there's a lot a lot here uh that we can use to still hold people accountable and it's the same tool and no matter what we're holding people accountable the same way whether they're in an office or not or whether they're traveling a lot I think how people measure accountability is specific and unique to each organization, whether you have productivity metrics or whether you don't, uh, or you have that unsung hero. And I think sometimes when we think about remote work, we, we forget about those unsung heroes, those that keep the morale up in the company, at the office, make people smile, make people laugh, take a bad day and make it that much better. One of the things I do like about having people get together on site at the office is I get to catch up and watch them grow and listen to them tell me about how their week went or what they did over the weekend while we're all tooling around with a new piece of technology in the office, in the conference room. And sometimes some of the best trainings I've been able to give our teams have come from those conversations. It sparks a discussion about a best practice or a new tool or or a new way to accomplish a certain project. I'm not saying that can't be done with remote work, but I do see where some people come from saying that inspiration can be lost. Now, do I think America is going to be destroyed because of remote work? Absolutely not. I think if anything, we'll actually probably strengthen it. And the example that you gave is rather ironic, considering that that person made a career working from home. <laughs> Maybe there's some self-loathing involved there. <laughs> well, probably still uh, fits just fine in the orange jumpsuit, too. Oh boy. Well, so, you know, we're talking about learning and 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 seeing people grow and stuff like that. And I think this segues really nicely into a you know part of this is that remote work is a very nuanced topic and distributed work even more so uh, as a as a larger umbrella topic. But I will say that I, I don't think that remote work is for everyone. It is a very difficult shift for for people, and and some people need or really desire the ability to have a strong separation between their work and home lives. Like, as Brandon mentioned earlier, it's easier for his work stuff to bleed into his after hours. Me, personally, I've actually found that the opposite to be true. I just started doing remote work, and one of the greatest things about it is that um, the mindset flip is so much easier for me to disconnect, because when I was in the office, in my previous employment where I worked in an office. Getting up and leaving was hard. And because I was in the work mode in the office, I would work ungodly hours. It's become easier for me to disconnect. And again, I think this highlights the difference in mindsets for different people. When you think about how people um, interpret and handle this, 
you can see whether it's going to work well for one or the other. And then there's the people that are new to the workforce entirely. Um, while it is certainly possible for someone to start off and be successful from a remote career, my personal belief is that they are better served by being around other people and, and developing a sense of culture and camaraderie directly, um, which I think is well, not impossible. It takes real effort and work and is much harder to do when you're not around people all the time when you're working. You know, that, that's just sort of my piece about it. Like, I've just, as someone who has mentored a lot of coworkers, it is so much easier when you can just work with them. And, and it's really hard to pull that off in an ad hoc, natural fashion with the current tools we have today for remote work. I'm not saying it can't get better. There are certainly ways it could. But the tools and stuff we have now, just they're not ideal for it. Well, I think you also mentioned the, the mindset that you need. And in order to kind of prepare yourself for that mindset, especially if this is a new thing for you, you need to learn how to set up your environment in such a way that you have some sort of healthy delineation between what is your home space and what is your workspace. And that especially applies if you are in the technology industry. Because for somebody who works in, let's say, managed IT, who maybe has a single computer that they use for work and home, it's extremely easy to get caught up in let me answer this work email while I'm also watching a YouTube video at seven o'clock at night. Maybe someone is used to that or enjoys working in that type of setup. Me personally, I can't do it. I have a separate setup for my workspace and a separate setup for my home space. And I generally don't do anything in my office with my office computer other than work stuff. And on my home computer, I only do home stuff. And so I, I have found that I need that physical delineation of technology in order for me to not gravitate back to work mode during the course of the week. I actually follow a very similar strategy. So I have a machine here in my, in my messy desk of stuff. I have a machine here that is my work machine. That it only has the work stuff. And then I have a KVM switch that flips it over to the other one. I don't have the desk space to have two separate setups and everything, but I do the best I can. I have a KVM switch where I can switch back and forth between the personal machine and the, and the work machine. And when it's on the work machine mode, it's very obvious that I'm doing work stuff. And when it's on the personal machine mode, I don't do work stuff on it. But also, more often than not, when I'm doing personal stuff, I'm probably not sitting at the desk. And I'm probably going somewhere else, either to my bed or another room or just somewhere, somewhere else, because somewhere else makes it easier to disconnect. I think another thing that people forget about when they work from home or work remote is that the office tends to be pretty routine. It's, it's pretty monolithic. Like You show up at a certain time, usually. You take your lunch break at a certain time, usually, and you leave at a certain time, usually. And I'm not saying that applies to everybody, hence why I'm kind of being generalized and saying usually about it. I find that when I'm working remote, and that doesn't even mean at home, I, I do travel frequently as well for work. That routine is very broken for me, especially when I'm out doing an install and I'll do things like I'll forget to eat or before I know it, it's nine o'clock. And instead of Cutting that time off at a at a set time, it's 9 p.m. at night, and I've been at it for 14 hours and didn't take any breaks, and I'm incredibly tired. So I think for people who are entertaining working remote or looking for healthier ways to work remote, a piece of advice that I can't offer enough is take regular breaks, step away from your space, go outside, go get a snack, go get a drink of water, do the things you normally would if you're going to be in an office type of environment, or maybe you work for a company that has extremely flexible hours and you can clock in and out. Maybe you're working with a creative organization and they're more interested in your total output than the times that you're scheduled in a, to be logged into a uh, collaboration tool or into an office application type setting. Uh, I think that 
it winds up being that there is no clear answer one way or the other for which way an individual person is going to work. If the place of work is willing to put in the effort and provides good tooling for doing so, you can have a successful either hybrid, remote, or otherwise distributed work environment. And that's really what is necessary in this modern world. Like we are, companies have to be in more places. Customers are more far flung. It's inevitable that you're going to have to have some kind of distributed work that you're doing. The question is, are you prepared for it? And do you have the tools for it? Exactly that. You just mentioned tooling. So what does some of that tooling look like? You know, if you're, if you're, a business leader that's looking to be successful in doing this at a small or a large scale, what sorts of tools are you employing? And one of the first ones that, or two that come to mind are either tail scale. So you're connecting your physical locations or your road warriors together and some sort of uh, hub, whether that's Git or Pagger or some other way that people can contribute and retrieve work on, on an ongoing basis. Your your suggestion of tail scale is pretty good. Like in the past, I would have probably recommended some crazy janky setup involving either open SSL VPNs or IPsec VPNs. Oh, I could tell you all about those. And, uh, and I don't want to hear it. <laughs> oh, we'll do that offline someday, Neil. You're, you're talking to the right person when it comes to uh, to network stuff. Oh, yeah, I know. But these days, you don't need to put in that kind of crazy effort. And recently, I, th- I saw recently that Tailscale expanded their functionality to provide ACLs for inviting people and cross-organization stuff with limited or full access to bridging tailnets, which is what they call their VPN networks. And it's just like, for that's, that's the dream, right? Like, super easy, scalable, high-performance bridging across wherever you are is what a VPN is for. And that is a core component of putting people together because bringing them onto a single you know, overlay network in this sense gives the ability to share resources effectively. Another aspect of it, like you said, if they're doing software development or they prefer a more software or code-oriented way of uh, data management, right? A, a version control system of some kind like Pagger or Calathea or GitLab or whatever, like these, these systems provide you the capability to run and host a me- uh, these repositories of content or code or both. But then there's, of course, traditional documents, as I mentioned earlier. You know, with only Office or or and Nextcloud and LibreOffice Online and Google Drive and all those things, right? Like your basics have to be covered, as well as this stuff, and you have to have a workflow for bringing it all together. So, so you mean like taking your source code files and manually uploading them to a file server is not a good idea? Oh, please don't do that, Bill. Please. Google Drive does have some capability of uh, version control. Not you too, Brandon. No, <laughs> stop it. Both of you. No, add. All right. So someday, Neil, you'll have to show me how to use Git the right way then, because I guess using FTP to upload all my source code is just a bad idea. I won't even deign that with a response. If you look at something like TailScale, and not even for the remote side, but just the distributed side, I have a situation where I have a client with multiple sites all over the country. And they are trying to retrieve data from different databases on different servers that they have out in the field. The traditional way of doing that with IPsec tunnels would be a complete nightmare, one that I would run away from as fast and as far away as I could. And we decided to try tail scale out. And our trial is not complete yet, but on paper, it looks pretty promising. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes, because this is an exact example of where an incredible piece of open source software, or you can even host it yourself with HeadScale, uh, where, where an amazing piece of open source software can help 
distributed groups work more efficiently together by simply just being able to have those servers on the local tailnet and pulling the ports they need to retrieve data from different databases. Are you going to say something, Brandon? I I don't know. So we're just that good, <laughs> I guess. Uh, on the uh, I'm configuring all the on a configuring for remote or for distributed work. I think one of the biggest. You brought up tail scale, which which helps solve this. Frankly, modern TLS is does solve this as well. Is security and really security today? I mean, not today. Always been this case. Is a person either losing a losing a device or document you know with a document not shredding it leaving something at a coffee shop it, that that's the stuff that i'm more worried about than than collaboration because i think a lot of the collaboration has been solved overall uh and apple's done a good job with being able to remote wipe devices pretty easily regard you know whether if it's uh you as an individual like they make it super easy to, to lock down a device with that enterprise tools, it's uh, super easy as well. That's uh, my uh, my concern. You know, we've talked about this before a couple uh, episodes ago with the Linux desktop and being able to handle this type of stuff, be able to remote wipe a lost device or be able to uh, restrict access of that device more effectively from being able to get on your network. More or less, it's there, but you know, securing the data. That's on a that's on a physical device. That's been my uh, that's my concern overall. Well, I guess that means we're talking about borderless security because that's that's I think the crux of what you're talking about, right? Like now that things are distributed or or remote, you don't have the benefit of a physical border to to protect your whatever it is resources documents. Layer one doesn't apply here, right? You don't have concrete, <laughs> but borderless security is a tough one because in order for that to work effectively, like lots of people are talking about this whole zero trust architecture. I mean, you can see it's splattered all over the news and the, and there's companies claiming to be zero trusty all over the place. Right. And the, the truth is nobody's doing it because a system in which you have to authenticate and check for authorization for every resource all the time is incredibly annoying. Everyone will hate it. So what do you do instead? You got to come up with ways to have pockets of, of borders wherever the data is being stored or transmitted. Uh, and that's just not something we're good at yet in the industry. Uh, mostly because people don't like thinking about that problem because it's really, really hard. And also because even in, once we conceptualize a solution to that problem, the actual effort to implement it is even harder. Um, there, there have definitely been people who have thought about this and, and worked through the concepts and figured out a way to implement solutions. But you still have so much you have to figure out. like. The trusting trust problem rears its ugly head all over the place here. And you're just, at some level, you're going to have to grant an implicit level of trust that you don't normally expect to give to something that's out of your control in order to make it all work. And that's something that nobody is particularly enthusiastic about admitting to. Combine this with the fact that... Um, there are fears of if everybody went all, all remote, you know, as in working from home, that there would be an economic collapse because no commercial facilities or whatever would be used. I don't buy that for a whole lot of reasons. But 
let's say that that happens, and it's like, of course nobody wants to work on it. Nobody wants to actually solve the problem, because I'd rather just bring everybody back into offices and, and put the little islands, because layer one is a very effective barrier stealing data. If you have concrete between you and someone else who's trying to get your data, it's probably going to stop them from getting your data. Well, it also touches upon the the human mindset of we always try to find the most convenient way of doing something. And security is not convenient. It's not designed to be convenient. But concrete is both secure and convenient. You get a message across to your employees in one shot, and it's secure unless you happen to be some sort of superhero and you can punch through concrete. Did you just seriously suggest hitting somebody with concrete as a way to get a point across? No, the other way around. You hit the concrete to get the data you want. Oh, the broken hand. Well, if you have superhero powers, Neil, you won't have a broken hand. You'll shatter the concrete. Who has superhero powers? Iron Man, hello. Wait, the Hulk. shouldn't this be Superman? The Hulk. <laughs> the Hulk. Pick your, pick your superhero, but... And you know what? If our audience are are true uh, nerds, they will they will find the appropriate superhero to dissolve the concrete and get the data, making layer one completely ineffective. And therefore, therefore, promoting the fact that borderless security is a thing. First, superheroines too. Yes, second, let's not forget them. Second, really. And on that note, I think we have reached the end of this. I don't know what this topic was, but it was definitely brought to you by the Tux Digital Network. And thank you for listening to the Pseudo Show, where we talk about the business of open source and maybe somehow nerd them. I don't know. Bye, y'all.